Hey, how's it going everyone? Carlo and Dylan here from All You Can Board, and we are in the middle of our countdown of our top 50 games of all time, about to kick off 20 through 11. Uh, before we get into it, I just wanna mention uh, the next, the 10 to one will be coming out in a couple days, and we thought it'd be fun if you guys wanted to maybe take some guesses, especially for people who have been uh, kind of longtime viewers of the channel, you might know some of the games we absolutely love. Uh, it'd be fun for you guys to take some guesses in the comments as to which games will be in our top 10 uh, in a couple of days, and we'll uh, definitely be checking up on that in the comments. Otherwise, I don't know about you, I'm kind of expecting there to be a decent amount of overlap uh at least three games in the over we will overlap on in this section we haven't had as much overlap in the last little bit yeah there's gonna be at least one i'd be surprised if there was wasn't at least one but i think three is a pretty good guess uh, just to be different i'll say two okay but, sounds good yeah. all right and without further ado i mean uh, if you missed the other ones go back and check out the other ones uh, from 50 to i guess 21 but uh, otherwise we'll kick it off with dylan's number 20. oh you can't do you not see what I what I've done here? <laughs> like I have baked some cookies that is uh, involves me opening a Pillsbury package and putting them in uh, the oven for today's session. And there's barely any left on the plate because I already ate the, pretty much half the package. I'm gonna say so, oversized so plate what, here. This is what's left. They're very soft. So at any time during the video, feel free to take a bite. How many did you just um, touch there? <laughs> as many as I want to eat, apparently. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to jump into mine. So, my number 20 is a game that I don't own, but Carlo does, and I really, really love, and I played a whole ton of it on Board Game Arena, and that's Res Arcana. Uh, uh, so, Res Arcana is a really great game, and I knew I was going to like it before um, either of us even owned it. I think you had brought it to my attention at one point, and I remember looking into it, and uh, and knowing I was going to enjoy it, but, you know, it, there was other games that were priorities for me at the time. When you finally got it, the first time I played it, I actually was disappointed. I was actually let down. I, I think it might have had to do just the way the session went because one of the things with Res Arcana is depending which cards are in the game, mm -hmm. you can have it where it's like, or which uh, things are in the game, it can be a really challenging way to, to, to experience it, right? Yeah. It, and so I feel like the first time I played, I remember you had a lot of dragons um, and it just felt like I didn't have a way to properly count them. So it felt like I was just constantly behind. I was like, ugh, this game... This doesn't. This isn't what I was expecting. It wasn't yeah. until I played it the second time, where it was a completely different set of cards, a more unique. I think we did the draft at that point, which was an optional right. way to start the game, and it was way more fun. And now every time I played it on B BGA, um, just the the whole meta now is as you slowly understand when certain cards are paired with each other, what that's going to mean, which ones you should grab, when you get a better idea of depending on which cards you have, which of the, um, what are they called? The, the places of power. Yes, that you're yeah. gonna go for. And even the monuments that are facing. For up. sure. Yeah. So I've like I've absolutely adored this game. Um, it's one that I'm likely gonna buy for myself at some point. Um, the, the reason, only reason I, I haven't is because I've been able to play it on Board Game Arena. Yeah. Um, if it wasn't for that, I'd already have it. So yeah, it's number 20 now, and if, if I honestly get a copy and I start playing it even more frequently with the, the physical edition, I could see this moving up. But uh, regardless, I really, really love it, and it's one of those ones that anytime over at your place uh, or or, you know, we're having a game night. Um, if someone suggests that, I'm 100% down to play the physical copy because most of the plays lately have been the digital copy. Right. I'd love to experience it that way again, so. Nice. Yeah. I actually forgot all about that this one would probably be on your list, so I think we might have actually four overlaps, but oh, uh, wow. it's a good pick, and honestly, I have to say, I was a little disappointed with it the first time I played it too. Yeah. Um, I won't say too much about it because we I'll have some more to say about it in a little bit, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, it's, it's a great pick, but I think Tom Lehman's games have a tendency to kind of like, a lot of people bounce off them off their first play or maybe even two plays, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's such a good game. Awesome. All right, my number 20 pick uh, is also a card game, also a tableau builder, and this is Innovation. So this is uh, designed by Carl Chudik. It is a fantastic game that I have not yet played enough of. This is one that I could see potentially being much higher up on my list one day because of the amount of um, stuff there is to basically explore in this game. It's basically a civilization game. You have cards that you're putting out. They can splay out to reveal these different symbols and you have these dogmas that apply. Um, and basically without getting too into the rules, it's a game where you feel like sometimes you can be so far behind. And I think we've played it together, what, once or twice? Was yes. it on Board Game Arena or Tabletop Simulator or something? And I'll say right now, the original version uh, published by Asmati Games isn't like, some people think it looks kind of dry, like they're just pretty basic looking cards with symbols and it's it's tough to get into. It's, it's a fairly complex game, even though the rules aren't that complicated, but it's this kind of idea of like racing through the ages. You start in age one and the game can go all the way to age nine and every age unlocks like new abilities and you start seeing different symbols on the cards the further in you get and you have this tendency to feel like you're really behind and you have no chance of winning and then suddenly you draw a card or you see something on the board between the cards that are in play that makes you realize like wait a second I can kind of 
flip this game on its head and maybe make a comeback and suddenly the other players on the back foot and you've like taken one of their cards or you've jumped ahead in the ages and now you have this age five card that does something crazy for you and like it feels like there's always a way out of it and i feel like even the i've only played it maybe six or seven times in total but every time I fit, uh, played, it's felt like a drastically different game. I know there's a bunch of cards I still haven't seen yet. So I think it's one that has the opportunity to be like a really replayable game that I might, like eventually I need to own this. I don't currently own it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely one of the more impressive games I've played, especially off of just a few plays. Uh, I fully expect it to be pretty high on this list next year. Nice, yeah. I Honestly, I've only played it the one time, so it's one of those ones that has completely slipped out of my mind since I last played it. Right. But I've heard so much about it, and I've heard you talk about it a few times, that I know if I go back to it, it'll probably have the same effect as some other ones where it just slowly hooks me more, and then next thing you know, it's one of the games I want to own in my collection yeah, as well. Yeah. So I want to go back to it. I should just play it on BGA. The only thing I'll say is I think it's is it, it's either the BGA implementation or the physical implement, implementation. Um, the artwork isn't, um, or the, the design of it isn't like all that attractive to me and that's the that's the asmati game so then right. elo also re uh, released their own version that has yeah. like really nice artwork and all this stuff but the like usability of the cards like where the symbols are and stuff it makes it harder to play the game even though right. it looks nicer so it's like an issue of do you want the game to look nicer or play right. better because it's more practical yeah they have to mesh the two together now. yeah exactly and it, as it is it's kind of a tough game to play because you're trying to compare symbols off of people's cards and stuff but anyway yeah. that's my number 20 pick innovation nice all right, uh, my number 19 pick is a game that I absolutely love that uh, I never thought I'd be able to own, and now I'm going to be owning it pretty soon, and that is called Fjords. Oh, uh, so Fjords right. is being reprinted, and it's coming out uh, next year, So I, and I have that back, so I'm going to be getting that. But up until this point, I've only played this at our local game cafe here in Winnipeg, which is uh, across the board, um, and I've played it, I think, three or four times there um, with different people, I think, almost every time. Uh, we played it once there, and I can't remember if we played multiple games in that set session, but we played it one time we were there. Um, I absolutely love this game, but again, I am like cautioning that I am basing this also off of the four plays I've had of it, but usually I would say for a two-player game after four plays, if I haven't uncovered something that's going to make me hate a game, it, it doesn't exist. At that point, I would right. know. And what I love about this game is, and other games have done this since, even ones that are on this list, but the two phases uh, yeah. that the game has are distinct from each other, but influence each other so in the begin you're basically building the board in the first stage you're placing the tiles which is something that has unique uh from even blue lagoon is that you're building the board so placing all these tiles down in similar way you've seen other tile games go where you have to put mountains to mountains paths to paths things like that um, and so you create this game space for yourself and as you're creating it, you slowly put these little huts on you have a limited supply and in the second stage those huts is where you're going to start uh, putting your little discs out and it's basically a territory control game on who can place them like get the most control with their with their discs but keeping in mind that you know certain ones are gonna be more accessible to you because of where your hut is and maybe you can uh, have you, you basically locked in the sections so you don't have to put any there until you know you fought for the other sections you want it be, you basically think about the game in two different ways but each one you're keeping something else in mind and it's just it's brilliant it's easy to learn it's easy to play and the more you play it the more strategic you get and it's one that if i had it in my collection i honestly probably would have played this like 30 40 times 50 times right now because there's so many people that i would have said let's just throw it on a game of fjords i feel like it would have been one of my go-to games in the same way that like a lot of other two-player games on my shelf sure. like jaipur and patchwork and uh, seven wonders duel have become that so i'm super excited to get this new version um yes it has a whole bunch of other bells and whistles and you are but honestly i i am just thrilled that i can play fjords whenever i want because i have not been able to do that that's the most exciting part to me and i cannot wait to introduce this to more people Nice. That's an awesome... I honestly forgot all about this game being on your list uh, when I was kind of guessing what you'd have on here. And I think I've only played it the one time with you like four or five years ago at Across the Board when you showed it to me. And I was completely blown away by it too because I remember having heard of the game previously or maybe checked afterwards. And I think it's rated even... Like the BGG rating is like under a seven. Like it's got yeah. a six point something, which yeah. is like... It's just wrong for it to... I don't know why people don't like the game that much. To me, it's it's awesome. And I love how sometimes you don't even have tiles that you can place. So you set them aside, set them aside. Yeah. And like, so the board's going to build differently every time. Yeah, very cool game. I can't wait to play more of it when you get that copy. Yeah, me too. All right. My number 19 pick is uh, another two-phase game, actually. It is a two-phase auction game, and that is For Sale. Uh, as of now, probably my favorite uh, filler game of all time. This is one of the most played games uh, for me in the last year, year and a half due to the pandemic. I uh, discovered this, uh, well, I'd heard about it before, but played it on Board Game Arena. I think I've got 50 or 60 plays logged on there now. Uh, 
Super simple, if you haven't played it, go check it out on Board Game Arena. The basic idea is everyone starts a certain amount of money and you're bidding on these houses, so every round a certain number of these pr properties will come out. You bid on them uh, and you, each player ends up taking a property and whatever until you have all the properties divided. And then in the second phase of the game, people are basically bidding their property, putting their properties out to get checks uh, basically that are written for the properties. And then at the end of the game, the player with the most money wins. Super simple, you can play it on Board Game Arena especially, it plays in what, like five, 10 minutes? Yeah, really. Like it's so fast. I got hooked on this game, like even playing Playing without um, like people I knew, I would just go queue up for a random game with strangers, and I played this game like 40 times in a row over the span of like two or three weeks before I introduced it to other people. And like now we each have the little travel edition version of the game. I think it's something that'll never leave my collection because of how simple it is. We talked about it in a different video, one of the previous ones, about kind of how late to the game we were with auction games, mm -hmm. and I feel like this is like the best auction game to introduce someone to auctions with, right? Because of how simple it is, but because of how fun, like everyone I've shown this game to seems to want to replay it all the time whenever we just need like a quick filler game. It's got the charming artwork of like the dog houses and, or the dog house and the spaceship and there's like the manhole or whatever, like there's all the funny little properties. I don't know, there's just something really charming about it. And the there's a lot of trash talking that comes into play when people outbid each other. It's just a really fun little game. Yeah, it is uh, for, I remember when you first introduced this to me, how much it surprised me just because um, it's not one that I expected to have as much of an impact uh, right. with me and with the other people at the table as it did, or one that I'd want to come back to as often as I did, but also just how much strategy there ended up being. And it's strategy you can't really explain to someone very well in the first time. You almost have to just play and realize like, oh, I see. So if I bet this way, it's doing this. Or if I'm the last one to bet, it means this. Like you kind Yeah, of I gotta to save money for later yeah, or whatever, yeah. yeah. Uh, is this one of the ones you thought we were gonna have a crossover? Yeah, actually. Yeah, so uh, this is actually not on my top 50. Wow, and I, it, wasn't this also your number one filler game of all time? We did our so, filler games? Yes, and so when I did the, the only reason it's not is when I did the the ranking system. Yeah. Rankings, yeah. Um, so it ended up being like, it's, it's between 50 and 60. Like it's just, okay. just off the list. And it just kept, like, I kept, the ones it kept going up against, I kept ranking higher and I kept thinking, like, but is that the right call? I'm like, it, like, it is. Like, I do. And I think sometimes I have a hard time with, like, filler games and party games in general, properly ranking right. them against something like Title Blades or, you know, uh, Everdell, things like that, because right. um, they're such a different experience. Yeah, right? and you're asking yourself, what would I rather play? In a lot of yeah. situations, you're not going to pick the filler game, but... For sure. Yeah. So I think that, you know, it's one that... I could easily probably go back and make a case that it should be on and next year maybe I will look at it differently and be like, you know what, it does belong in here. But I'm glad you put this high to counteract that um, and I'll try to, you know, look at it differently next year because you're Fair right. Enough. It honestly probably should have been but there was just so many games that I wanted to put on and it's just one that kept slightly bumping off. So, yeah, fair yeah. enough. I'm sure we'll both have regrets of games that didn't mm -hmm. make our list. And uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll hear for it. We'll uh, hear it in the comments from people. Yeah, How exactly. How you not include that? Exactly. Uh, all right, my number uh, 18 game is uh, called Clank, a deck building adventure. So Clank is a game I've had for a long time in my collection. I've played it so many times. Um, it's just, it, for a long time, it was a, it was a go-to game um, in terms of like, if, if we couldn't decide what to play or with any player count really, it was like, what about Clank? Because people, a lot, I'd introduced it to everyone by then. It, everyone had their, you know, their their, head, their heads wrapped around the concepts and the strategy. Um, what I love about Clank is that it became my de facto deck builder. It was the, it's the reason I ended up getting rid of Dominion. They're very different games, but it was, it was the easiest deck builder for my collection to introduce to people. Um, and it was the most fun deck builder in my collection for a long time. Um, and that's just because there's so many cards there the artwork is really really gorgeous it's not just about building your deck it's also about the fact that you're using the cards in your deck to, to delve into this dungeon um, with your characters and try to uh, scoop up the most valuable treasure that you can but you're, as soon as someone scoops up treasure it essentially puts everyone else on a timer because that person can now choose to push their way out of the dungeon and that means that you have a certain amount of turns to get out or you lose pretty much a large part of your points or at least to get above ground level so there's a lot of things going on. It's deck building, it's racing, it's you know pushing your luck. Uh, yeah. There's the the dragon that is adding more of your cubes, your clank cubes, noise cubes into the bag, um, and you're having to use that to, to think like, okay, how many do I have in there? What's the likelihood that mine are going to get drawn? Off? Could do, do I think I can survive another turn? Um, there's a whole lot of stuff at play, but yet, in, if you, even if you just look at it from the deck building perspective, the cards are super interesting. I have the expansion, the first expansion as well, that adds a whole bunch of unique cards in. There's there's other expansions I don't have. There's other versions. There's a legacy version I haven't even picked up that's high on my, my wanted list so it's a world I've really enjoyed playing even just the base game with and that's without me having uh, uh, dived into the, the rest of it so uh, it's a game I still go back to I still play I play 
played it this year. I love it. Um, and I, I likely will not get rid of it for a long time unless I get another version of it uh, that replaces it or another game that's very similar to it that replaces it. Nice. Yeah. Very nice pick. Yeah, it's a really fun game. I've only played it two or three times with you before. And I think when I think of a deck building race game, I tend to always, like if we're here, I always suggest Quest for Eldorado ahead yeah. of Clank, which I know yeah. we both had earlier on our on our list, but uh, it's one I want to go back to, especially because I haven't tried it with the expansion yet. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, and it, and it, I mean, it's not, it's not a huge expansion, but again, more more cards in a deck builder usually changes up the game enough to make it more interesting. Yeah, so. it has a lot of fun moments throughout when you're pulling the cubes out of the yeah, game. Yeah, lots of sure. laughing and hilarity around yeah, the table. Yeah, it so. always ends differently, too. Yeah. All right, uh, my number 18 pick here is Noosefjord. So this is uh, a game that I don't own that Dylan does. Um, Go check out our games we'd steal from each other's shelf video if you're curious where uh, where it ranked for me. But uh, I can't even remember what I had this at. It was if it was the last video or the one before that. I had this. On yeah, my it was in your twenties to yeah. mid twenties or something like yeah. that. I knew you'd have it higher than me because I know you like it. I, I love this game. I've only played it two or three. I think we've played it twice. Maybe not even three times. I think it was three times. Maybe it is three. Yeah, yeah. And but it's always been at two players. It's yeah. the only player count I've played it at. But it's already one of my favorite Uwe Rosenberg games that I've played, uh, partly because um, it has a lot of the kind of uh, more cutthroat interaction for the work replacement spots that Agricola does, which we'll talk about some other time. Um, but basically it has you like competing over these, like you're, you're a fisherman and you basically have your boat and there's only three resources in the game, right? It's uh, wood, fish, and then your gold or your money yes. basically. Yep. And so it's, there's not like a whole bunch of different resources to manage. You just have your pretty basic stuff. You have your boats where you have to load it on. The fish gets distributed, but it's a very like closed, very interactive system. You, most of the things you can do in the game, there's only one spot on the board to, to do it, maybe a second one. So you're like, it's a lot like there's a lot of blocking your opponent there's a lot of stuff you do not because you really want it but because you know how much it's going to set your opponent back there's the variable stuff with all the the level c buildings or whatever that come out where you can plan your strategy from the start and think okay this game i'm going to go for this stuff but i always find that we both have to like adapt along the way and be like okay i can't really do that anymore or based on the actions i took to block you now i have different stuff that i didn't plan for so i have to go for something else now uh, it's a really, really interesting game. One that I've heard plays well uh, at solo as well mm -hmm. and three and four players. So I'm eager to try it at other player counts. Um, it's one that I don't know how high it'll stay up on the list after I play it more. I could cool on it eventually or it could even go higher up on the list. But I feel like it's one that a lot of people maybe dismiss uh, in Rosenberg's catalog just because it's just like, even if you look at the cover, it's just like it looks maybe a little bit dry. Just like, oh, a game about fishing. There's enough games out there about that. But yeah. uh, I love this game. I've had such a blast every time we play it. Do you think you'll ever own your own copy of it? Or do you think you I get think it? So. You're still oh, you think I've, so? Okay. I've seen, yeah, I've seen it uh, listed online before and I almost bought it in the past. Mm -hmm. And then over the last like six months to a year, it seems like it's always sold out. Right. And I feel like I have enough unplayed games that I don't feel I need to get it yet. But eventually, especially if you don't suggest it often enough when I come over, I'll probably have yeah. to buy my own copy someday. Or steal it off my shelf. And if you exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or at least borrow it to try the solo mode or yeah. something. Yeah, it's a great game. Um, all right. Uh, my number 17 is another Uwe Rosenberg game, and that is Holler Tau. Okay, yeah. So Holler Tau, I debated for a long time where this was going to end up on the list, and, and I, I will be the first to admit that I, I am swayed, you know, uh, towards Uwe games, um, sometimes even more than, I don't want to say more than I should, but I feel like, you know, if I really sat down and played certain games back to back to back, maybe I'd rank them slightly differently, but regardless, I think that it earns this spot. It's a really unique Uwe Rosenberg game, not the best Uwe Rosenberg game, but it does so much differently than the other ones I've played still that I think that that's what keeps coming back to it. And the, and the fun fact about it is just like Res Arcana, the first time I played it, I wasn't all that impressed. And there was parts of it I was, but I feel like it's because I didn't quite understand um, it was you was seeing you use the card system that got me to better understand Holler Town, mm. and that was realizing that like because it, it uses the cards a lot differently than uh, you know other Uve games, oh, for sure. and that if, when you really lean into that and, and use them the way that they're supposed to and give them their proper due in this game, you end up having a lot more fun with the game. You realize how much variety there is in the cards. In fact, there's all these different decks you can use. So every game you can put in different decks. You can start mixing them together if you want to get crazy. Um, the the worker placement system, even just the fact that every time you go to a space, you're having to pay one more up to a max of three means that it starts to get really 
really mean with the spots. Yeah. I mean, you're not removing every all the pieces every single round. Like, if, for instance, in a four-player game, you just remove the top row of every spot, which means that like if, if a bunch of rows are completely filled up, all you're doing is removing the, the three spot, which means that now to go to that spot, you have to put three workers, which is, that's, a, that's like one-fourth of your workers yeah. to use one action. So it starts to get really tough to make decisions. Um, and the fact that you're doing everything in service of trying to move the community center, the, the building in the center, to the right, but to do that, you have to move all the small buildings, which all to do all that, you have to generate uh, resources from the fields, but the field system's unique too, because it's like right. with fallow fields where, you know, the higher they are, the more they produce. It's not just producing one. If you're, if you're producing on the top, you can be producing five, right, for that one, but then it decreases, right? Like there's so much going on in this game that's unique, and when you put all those pieces together, and you realize you have one goal, which is just not one goal, but like your most important goal is move the community center. It actually becomes pretty easy to narrow your focus while doing it in a completely different way mm -hmm. and, and with a completely different path than your opponents. For sure. I, I really enjoy it. I love it. I'm gonna it's one I thought when I first played it, maybe I won't keep this long term, but I, I've enjoyed I enjoyed that play. Now I'm convinced that it's gonna be one of the ones that stays in my collection for all because I still haven't played with four. I've only played with two and three, and I'd love to play it with four and actually just start getting into the table more often and see which which one's the most mean, which one's the most fun. So yeah, awesome Uve game. Um, I can't say enough good things about it. And if it's his last big box game, like some people have suggested, um, he did go out, out on a high note at least. Fair enough. I'm in a way slightly disappointed to hear what you said because I was hoping that one day if you got rid of it, I would probably just buy it <laughs> off of you. But I'm also pleasantly surprised because I really enjoyed it when we yeah. played it and I thought you didn't maybe enjoy it quite as much as me. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a really, really interesting game and one that I've only played it the one time and it was now like more than six months ago, I think. Yeah. So it was tough for me to even consider it for my top 50, but uh, one I definitely want to play a lot more in the future and uh, I could see Rig going up on my list in the future. Yeah. It's an awesome game. Yeah. Super fun. All right. Number 17, sticking with Uwe Rosenberg. Wait. Yeah. 17, sticking with Uwe Rosenberg here is Glass Road. Mm. So this one I do own. This is one of my games that's been in my collection the longest. Um, and you'll notice, like, I just put Newsfjord at 18. Newsfjord and Glass Road are two of his most similar games in many ways. Um, other than his, like, polyomino games that all feel kind of similar-ish or whatever, or comparing Novaluna to Sagani, but it's got this kind of weight where it's, it's heavier than his polyomino games, but it's less uh, heavy than games like, you know, Agricola, Feast Road, and Hallertau, whatever. It's kind of in there in the middle where it plays. You know, once you know the system of the game, you can play it in 45 minutes to an hour. And it, it's a simple, fairly simple game. Plays well at all player counts, solo to four players. It's actually of games that aren't primarily solo. It's got one of the best solo modes I've ever tried. Um, and it's an awesome game because... Uh, it plays over four rounds and you basically, every player has these like 15 specialist cards. Everyone has the same 15, but every round at the start of the round, you pick five of them and then you set the other 10 aside. And then from those five, you pick three that are going to be the ones you know you can play. And then you keep two other ones kind of secret in front of you. And then you go around and you'll reveal a card and say like, I'm playing the clay worker. And if anyone else has the clay worker in their hand, they get to also put it down in front of them. Uh, and so you're going around trying to anticipate what other players are going to play because you're going to end up getting to play three to five cards each round if you can piggyback off of that, right? And then what I love too that I've never... I know this is apparently in Aura at Labora, which I haven't played, but it's got that genius resource wheel where you only need one of each resource type in terms of the actual components because this wheel is where you track everything and when you have one of every of the main resources, the wheel will turn and produce either a glass or a brick depending on which wheel it's on. It's got this awesome simplicity. It's very like elegantly designed. And then you're just basically you're, like gaining resources and then buying buildings to put on your terrain. It's super simple what you're actually doing. But, and like the winning score is usually low. It's like 18, yeah. 20, 25, whatever. Uh, it's a game that I always feel like when it's done, I want to play it again and I want to try to do better. And I don't go back to it often enough. It's been a while since I've, I played it a couple times solo in the last year, um, but it's been a while since I've played it at like two or more. Uh, it's definitely one I want to revisit. So for now, it's slightly ahead of New Steward on my list. Yeah, it's, I've only played it two or three times and all of them were with, with your copy. Um, I've enjoyed it every single time. I'm hoping I can get it to the table more and I'm hoping that now that it's been reprinted, that yes. even more people will get their hands on and be able to play it because I, I think there are a lot of people where it just, they're either unaware of it or flew under the radar, whatever the case yeah. may be. And I think that 
even just for the resource wheel alone and having to manage your resources and know when they're going to automatically produce brick and glass and things yeah. like that that alone is super fun and unique let alone having the way you're choosing you know which which roles you're going to put down and how it's going to, both of you and your opponent are going to benefit off them yeah. it's, it's a whole ton of fun and it's actually been too long since i've played it so we should definitely play it again soon. yeah definitely we'll have to just have an uve day where we play yeah. with fjord glass road hollow Tau, and, and buy a new uve game to play as well yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. All right, my number 16 game is a game called Pandemic Legacy. Um, this is a game that I absolutely adore. It was my first uh, foray into legacy board games, so it has a sort of a special place uh, in, in the nostalgic part of my heart. I can almost guarantee you that as time goes on, this is gonna just keep slipping down the list because I'm never gonna go back to it uh, personally, um, and other games are just gonna end up replacing it, but it still is one that resonates with me. I still recommend to people um, that, they, that they pick up and play, especially if they're wanting to get into a legacy game. Um, I played the campaign over the course of a year. So it was basically, and in the game, it's funny because the game takes place over a year, right, 12 yeah. months. So it almost felt like we were playing in real time. Um, but it, it had so many memorable twists and turns to the Pandemic formula, which I was already a huge fan of. Pandemic was the first board game I bought, so that felt special. Watching the, the landscape of the first board game I purchased and got into change in front of me and add all these new wrinkles into it. Uh, and then on top of that, the ending of our campaign ended, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but ended on a single, on the very last card that we could flip over. So it was just this, oh. it was this super memorable ending, super memorable, memorable campaign. It, it made me fall in love with legacy games. It honestly is one of the reasons that I gravitate so much towards legacy games I, I couldn't not include it on this list and when I started to like really think about comparing it to other games on the list I had to give it extra points because of all the nostalgia that's associated with it so and and it honestly is just a phenomenal game uh, if anyone is, uh, has not played this but enjoys pandemic any version I would highly recommend checking it out just because I mean you can check out any of the three uh, versions of this now the, the season two or season zero but the first one I think is is you know, it just, it, it sticks sticks the closest to the pandemic formula and then slowly changes in the same way that my city sticks to this polyomino mm. thing and then, you know, changes it. I feel like it's just such a great starting point. And again, if you have a lot of experience with pandemic, it's going to be one that you're just going to have your mind blown in some of the ways that uh, they, they change things on you and add in all different things but my recommendation would be to play with two for that because it's easier mm -hmm. to get the group together yeah. uh you know if you have your, if you live with a partner or roommate or whatever really easy to just bring this out leave it set up some of the time um but yeah highly recommended uh and that is where it's the highest it's probably ever going to be on my, a top 50 of mine right. but yeah Pandemic cool legacy. yeah so i remember you talking about this uh to me when you played through it and i've been curious about it for a while i'm not quite as into legacy games as you are but this is of any legacy game i haven't played this is the one i've probably thought about buying most often it's been in my cart before just because i know anna really likes pandemic i could yeah. probably get it played uh, with her so yeah. it's probably one i'll pick up at some point honestly nice all right, my number 16 game uh, is Kingdom Builder. This is kind of an old favorite uh, of mine. It's, um, I think it won the Spiel des Jahres in whatever year it came out, I think it was 2011. Uh, same designer as Dominion, and it's a very, I would say, polarizing game. I know uh, I've heard a lot of people saying they hate this game or they don't really? see the appeal. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah, okay. well, check out This Game is Broken podcast. I okay. think it's Dave yeah. Luzo on there, always talks about how he hates, it's a running joke about how much he hates Kingdom Builder. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's an awesome, awesome game and it's got a lot of replay value. It's one that I played, if anyone who watches this channel regularly might remember I talked about in one of my culling videos before that I was getting rid of it. That's only because of at that time I knew Winter Kingdom was coming out and Kingdom Builder wasn't hitting the table anymore for a few reasons. Uh, first off being that I played so much of it on the app for a while that I got a little bit tired of it and also just that it's a tough one. Once you get really good at the game or you've played it a lot, it's tough to introduce new players um, just because there is a lot of like there's a fairly high skill ceiling and there's little things that you only kind of notice after multiple plays and stuff. It's still a game I'm happy to go back to. I played it recently on Board Game Arena with three players and it was such a satisfying game. And I almost thought about maybe I should not call it because it's still sitting on my shelf to sell. I haven't actually got rid of it yet. But now that I got Winter Kingdom and we got to try it, I do think I'm gonna ultimately get more legs and long-term I think Winter Kingdom will be the better game for me. But uh, such a such a great game. And it, what I love most about it is that ability to make those brilliant, clever moves. Like I really like in games where you can do something where you know people at the table afterwards say like, oh man, that was a great move, right? Yeah. Um, you, where you earn the victory exactly yeah. there's like no luck involved well, i mean there's some luck in the cards you draw and i guess that's my one complaint is if you are playing with someone who is like sort of equal skill level to you sometimes the draw of the cards at the beginning can determine who gets to an important spot first mm -hmm. and blocks other people from getting that one 
ability like the lake one and if the other person can't get there depending which objectives are out sometimes you feel early on like okay i'm gonna lose this game because i didn't get that one tile so i don't know it still is an amazing game still holds up really well today uh but one that definitely won't be going higher up on my list just because now i have winter kingdom so nice yeah i uh i will have more to say on this later uh this is a phenomenal game though uh so what i will say here is that we did just play winter kingdom and uh believe it or not i think that I'll have to play it a couple more times, but I think it's possible that I would end up wanting to buy Winter Kingdom and replace Kingdom Builder with it, yeah. only because it it keeps all the elements that I loved about Kingdom Builder. Um, it adds in a whole bunch more variety that would give it more legs. So, yeah. and you're right, because I've also played a ton of Kingdom Builder. But yeah. again, there's part of me that also just wants to keep the original as like a nostalgia thing on my shelf. For but sure, yeah. It's a, it's a great game, and I, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Sounds good. All right, uh, my number 15 pick uh, is a game that I don't hear talked about as much, or I didn't, and now I feel like I've heard more channels than other people talking about, and that is Ghost Stories. Uh, so oh, wow, I did not see this one coming on your list. No? Yeah, I, so I love Ghost Stories, and the, literally the only problem with Ghost Stories is that I don't, I don't suggest it now because I'm the only one who owns it, but every time I have, almost every time we end up playing multiple games because everyone's having such a fun time, and it's one of the, and every single time I've played, it ends up being something that way after that game night everyone's still talking about yeah. that experience or remember this remember that like it's it's so memorable and it creates so many fun hilarious challenging moments around the table that it, it just had to be on here and, and then when i really thought about it and started comparing it to other games i realized how much fun and how many memories i already have with this um having only played it probably like you know a dozen times um over the course of i've owned this now for it was like I got it really early on. It was one of the yeah. first board game orders I actually pulled. Probably had at least five or six years. Right? Yeah, um, it's it's a cooperative game, but it and you know I, I really I do enjoy cooperative games, but this one is extra challenging. And everyone does have their own role and their own abilities that they're contributing to the team, and and no one feels like they're really out of it or you know isn't really doing their part. Everyone at one point needs to use their ability to help defeat it. The board will get out of control. That you're being overrun by ghosts on all different sides of different colors. You're having to think of not only your own board but think okay if i don't do something to help this person next when it's their turn if they get a ghost they're going to be in trouble and then we're going to lose their ability and then this uh we're going to lose access to this area in the center of the board it's there's so many sides to, to look at and it's one of those uh, beautiful challenging games where you actually feel like you're doing good until like right at the end and then suddenly you're just like what happened? Like, how is this, how is it possible that we're just like in this much of a mess now? Yeah. And it just like turns at the last second. And then all of a sudden you're like, bring out the final boss quickly. We need to get to him. Cause we're going to, we can't keep this under control anymore. There's too many things going yeah. on and it ends up being this race to see, can you beat it or not? There is obviously a luck element with the dice that are being rolled. There's not a lot of ways to manipulate them. There's ways to get additional colors, like tokens to help you pay for things. Yeah. But there have been times where you roll dice and you're just like, well, uh, that should have been a, a win, and we absolutely right. lost. And even depending which ghosts come on which order and yeah. where they end up, but yeah. But I never felt like something that like uh, you know made me upset or made me no, regret no. regret playing the game or thinking oh we did all that work and then it came down to luck or anything. It's it's an aspect of the game you're aware of, you keep it in mind, but there's so much skill and planning that is involved that it never feels like it's outweighed. So yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely adore it, um, and I need to make a better effort of actually suggesting this more because I feel like every time I played it, it's one of those things where why haven't we played this in so long, right? Yeah, it's an awesome game. Yeah. Definitely the toughest, most brutal co-op I've ever played, yeah. it. and it's not even close. <laughs> like, and I know you said that it gets a lot harder at the end and whatever, but but yeah. to me, I've still never, of any co-op, I think it also starts the most punishing. Like, it feels like this sense of dread creeps in very early in the game. I feel like I never feel comfortable playing Ghost Stories. <laughs> we talked about it in our uh, most stressful games video as one of the ones that stresses us out the most. But yeah, yeah. it's one I definitely want to play again. Yeah, that is Great Ghost Stories 15. All right, my number 15 pick uh, is another abstract game. Uh, not saying abstract as in ghost stories but as in kingdom build my previous pick and that is santorini so this is a well i was gonna call it a two-player game it's primarily two-player definitely it should best. just be a two-player i know i know well, i mean like the three-player mode can still be fun but yeah, it ends fun up with three, yeah. the three-player ends up being the king making thing where as soon as one person's close then the other two players look at how can we stop this person from winning right so i just like it more as i think it works best as a two-player game i have no interest in ever playing it with four i would still play it with three but it's way better with two. Yeah. Uh, chess style abstract, plays so quickly. It's actually re-released a few years ago. I think it was 2014, 2015, 
after previously being an old game that just had like a blank board with white and black tokens. It was super basic looking before, but the idea is you're trying to move your little two characters around and get to the third floor. You're stacking these little building things and the first person to jump up to the third story of one of these buildings wins. The production is beautiful, uh, modeled after obviously the city of Santorini in Greece. Um, and it's what makes the game fun because the original version didn't have god powers It was just trying to get to the level right and if you try it that way It can feel a little bit dry That's obviously if you were to play in like a tournament in the competitive Aspect and you cared about it being purely a game of skill you wouldn't use the god powers But when we play we always use them It's a game that I only end up playing maybe a few times a year But every time it comes off the shelf we play we've talked about this before at minimum three to five games yeah. the Last time I showed it to someone I brought it over introduced it to someone new we played it I think seven or eight rounds in one sitting um, because you just change up the god powers, different setup, change up the god powers, and it doesn't matter if they feel imbalanced or one of them feels harder to win against the other one. That's part of the fun is like yeah. when you tackle one where you feel like you're sort of behind the gun and then you figure out a way to kind of pull off this sneaky victory, like you, you feel so good and the other person usually just like tips their hat to you and you just set it up and go again. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll never get rid of this game from my collection. There's, there's nothing else I own that quite does the abstract thing with the, the height aspect of the kind of stacking and jumping up. Yeah. Um, I imagine you'll have more to say about this uh, yes. later I'll have more on. To say, I'll have more to say later on, so all I'll say right now is I agree with you. I will likely never get rid of it. The only way I would is if, is if another abstract game, like, you know, I've... I've backed Ragnaroks and some other ones. If something right, comes right. along that somehow I see as like better where it just always gets to the table instead. Right, Otherwise, right. yeah, Fair I enough. agree. I would never. Or if they it. release an edition that has a theme, like yeah. they did Santorini in New York, which I think both of us were like, ah, I don't need to go get the New York version, but maybe yeah. there's, if they did Santorini Marvel, you'd be right? I was right? literally just going to say, like <laughs> Marvel <laughs> Santorini is going on That's the only one you'd sell. All the Marvel, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> if, if 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 you are listening, whoever is gonna like finance that game, this is what you need to Don't do. Don't do it. Know. Marvel, Marvel Santorini. At that point, you probably can't even call it Santorini. And all the god powers are now hero powers. This is genius. Do it. Print but it. I'll, wouldn't it I'll take something away now. from the Marvel theme if it was like Spider Man? You just have to jump to the third floor of it. It's like why is Make Spider Man care about being on top of a building? Hear me well, out. Maybe I picked the wrong hero, but like instead of it being the Santorini Greece towers, each one is three pieces of Avengers tower. I haven't seen the event. I don't know. Oh, my. <laughs> this is just... I'm just going to... Stick I'm to gonna, regular Santa. I'm just going to move the way on it here. Is. <laughs> All right. My, uh, my number 14 uh, is Champions of Midgard. Uh, so this is a worker placement game that I've played a bunch of times at every single player account. It's probably the worker placement game. No, it's not the one I've played the most, but it's up there. I've, I've played it a whole ton. I've introduced it to a lot of people. I feel like I've, it's one of the games I've taught the most of my collection. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. I've heard, I've heard like a lot of mixed things about it. I actually just had a discussion uh, with someone about this, about how you know uh, the thing that they dislike the most is when you have to cross the sea to go fight the the sea monsters and the fact that you can you know you could have to over plan essentially because you don't know what you're going to be flipping over and if it's something that's going to take resources off your boat um and if you and so you over plan for it and if if it's just clear waters you're like well i just wasted those resources for nothing so there's elements i can understand um but i have so much fun playing it i i now have the expansions i played with the expansions i feel like that is the now my favorite way to play um all, I, I love worker placement games where there's a whole bunch of different things you can do and you, you do different things every turn and uh, there's spots that from one game to the next will be unique because there are unique spots that you're dealing with as cards kind of like, kind of like Everdale has this, has that with different tiles. So every game feels unique. Uh, the, the the cards that you can pull up for your sort of like end game goals you're trying to uh, go for are different every game, which ones you're going to you're gonna grab. So there's enough variety from game to game. I like dice combat. It's just something I've always, I've always enjoyed. Maybe it's because I played Risk growing up. So the fact that this has dice combat and it's done with a whole bunch of different types of dice the expansion adds in even more uh is just like right up my alley it scratches that itch for me and it's i have a lot of fun with it it's one of the things i enjoyed in oath as well i, I just something right. i enjoy um so yeah there, there's a whole lot of elements here i i fully admit that like this for some people might be a surprising place for it because i know that i probably like this a lot more than maybe some people do but it's one that i've never had a bad game of and even for all of its things you know the bits of luck that are involved in it or the things that i might think another worker placement does better the full package of champions and the theme and everything like that is one that every time i play i have a great session i had a great time and it, when i'm packing it up it's just, it's just like the memories flood back and like yeah that is i do love that game and so I, I i just kept moving up on the list when i compared it to games and uh this is where it lands and i i fully support it being at 14 for my list 
Nice. Okay, this, we haven't played this in a long time now. I think we played this together three or four times. It's been years now. Yeah. I love the aspect of the troll in the yes. village, and yes. it's like whoever doesn't the fight the troll, it. what is yeah. it? Get, is it shame or something yeah. like that that you get? Yeah. I love that aspect of it. I think the first three or four times I played it, I really liked it, and then I don't know what. Ha I think the last time we played it, I remember feeling afterwards that I was like, hmm, I liked it, but I didn't love it anymore. And I don't know mm -hmm. if it was that. It didn't feel like there was enough uh, variety compared to the previous time we had played it. Or maybe it was just that I felt like because it's worker placement and there's some worker placement games that we love so much, maybe I just felt like I would have rather had played a different worker placement right. game. But I don't think I'll ever turn down a game of it, especially now that you have the expansion. So yeah. uh, I would definitely like to play this again. Yeah. Awesome game. All right, number 14 on my list might surprise you. This is another one that I think might surprise a lot of people with how high up uh, on the list it is. Uh, that is Tiny Towns. So this is a game that I think is very underrated. I don't know why it is. I, I suspect that part of it might be the really kind of um, cute animal artwork. I feel like what that does is it appeals to a more wide kind of mainstream set of like there's there's like like family gamers and maybe people who are newer to the hobby give it a chance. But I feel like a lot of more experienced gamers see that and are maybe a little bit off put thinking it's just a family game. But um, I love the kind of spatial puzzle of this four by four grid that you're trying to like figure out how to fit these buildings into. I love the aspect of the player interaction that isn't directly mean. You're not attacking someone. There's no direct take that. Like I play a card and I, you know, wreck your stuff or whatever, but the calling of the resources where you know that, yeah, I can do something with this, but it wouldn't be my first choice, but I know that other people are going to struggle to take this resource. You keep calling glass every round or whatever, yeah. just because it frustrates <laughs> people. You know, they can't do anything with it. I love the fact that every player has a monument card that it ha you keep secret at the start. So everyone has a different objective that makes you not all go for the same thing based on the building cards that are out there because you're going to try and do something different with your monument. Um, and I love that for a game that plays in only 45 minutes to an hour kind of range, not only is it simultaneous play with no downtime, but you actually get like not a lot of games that play this quickly have like a long term strategy where you can look at the thing at the start and come up with something. But you have to actually like almost like Dominion where you have the layout of the cards. You look at all the buildings and think, OK, this game, I'm going to try to do this and this and maybe I'll focus on these buildings to maximize my score here. And of course, you're going to have to adjust along the way because you're forced to take resources you don't want. But uh, because of all the cards that are in the box and just so to be clear, I've played this more now with the uh, Fortune expansion. There's another one that I have that I haven't tried yet, Villagers or whatnot. The Fortune expansion, I think, elevates it to a new level um, because of what it lets you do with the money system. I won't get too, too into that. There's a video on our channel about it. But uh, yeah, I've played Tiny Towns probably at least 20 to 25 times since I got it. It's one of the sort of of the games I've gotten the last few years. It's definitely one of the most played in my collection and one that seems to be a hit with everyone I show it to. Um, and yeah, it's one I'll be playing for many years, I think. Yeah, uh, this was on my short list. Um, it really, the only reason I didn't make it is because I haven't played it a lot, having not owned it. Um, and it's been a long time since I have played it now. But I really enjoyed it. I loved when we played it. I think we played it at Across the Board. Um, yeah. And I loved uh, constantly calling the same thing that you didn't need and seeing the effects <laughs> yes. that it had on your mental state. That was, that was <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, it was pretty frustrating. Um, if, uh, fun fact, this is the uh, quickest how to play we have on our channel. We've, we've joked about this. Oh, yeah, true. Carlo teaches this game in like five minutes or less than five minutes uh, and, and in very good fashion. So Thank you. that's the current uh, benchmark for quick uh, how to plays on our channel. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's one that I think if I play more of, it would for sure make my list. And, and yeah, I'm surprised. I guess I always just assume that it's a popular game that a lot of people play because we always talk about it. And then mm. I remember you mentioning that like, you know, it's underappreciated, uh, or at least not a lot of people seem to mention it, and that surprised me. And and I it, and because I just I just assumed I just like had the assumption based on how much fun I had, how much variety there is, and and usually that type of gameplay would resonate. They would be one that everyone would be playing and talking about. Yeah, had, had I don't know. Classic, and I think it has like a seven point two rating on BGG or something. It was a first time designer, so I think people yeah. maybe dismiss it for those reasons. But like, it plays up to six players and yeah. it's simultaneous and like in under an hour. What? What? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah, angry I, now. yeah, sorry, a little worked up here. Let's cool down. Listen, have a cookie. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll have I'm, a gonna, cookie. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell people about the next pick. <laughs> uh, my number was this thirteen. Now number mm -hmm. thirteen is uh, a game called Quacks of Quedlinburg. So Quacks of Quedlinburg is a game I absolutely adore, and I knew it after the very first time I played it. Sometimes you just play a game and you get a feeling from it that you know it hit something inside that you're going to want to play it again. Uh, I don't have that happen all the time, even with games that I end up adoring. But at, this one was after the first play, and, and it's funny because I know why it doesn't resonate with some people. I know why other people might not like it as much as, as I do or some people do. I, I completely understand because so much of this is based on luck uh, and and 
yes, you're building your bag your way, and so you do have some influence on what's in your bag and what the likelihood is, but that doesn't change the fact that sometimes I've been the one on the receiving end where I have this perfectly built bag and I should be in perfect form and I draw all the, whatever the white tokens are called, the cherry bombs or whatever they yeah, are. Um, I draw literally four in a row and I'm out and I, I can't even fathom how that the, the, how it's even possible. Um, so I know that that happens and it's frustrating, but I feel like that frustration, it just comes with the territory of the game. So you know what you're getting into and mm. the fact that the matter is there's so I still have not experienced every single ability that Quacks of Wettlinburg has because I also have the expansion because you can have, right. each color can have a different ability and you can pair different ones together that you can eventually come up with your own combinations that you're like this is to have a really wild experience this is to have a more controlled experience you know this is one that we play with this group compared to this group there's so much you can do to change up each game to keep it feeling fresh and I've never once played Quacks of Wettlinburg and not been laughing and I feel For like sure. anything that makes you laugh and, and have a good time it's got to be doing something right so even if it's not the most strategic game even if it's not you know the one that you're going to play when you really want to use your brain and feel like i just found a way to victory or whatever that's not what you're going to get out of quacks but you are going to have an absolute ride around the table and it's really not that hard to introduce to people either because you can kind of talk them through turns rather than have to explain a lot you can right. say this is in your bag at this point reach into your bag pull out and and pull out a, uh, one of the chips and and tell them what what it does kind of thing so i've, I've had a lot of success introducing it and I've never introduced it to someone. I know you. One of your friends doesn't doesn't enjoy it, but out of people, out of people, he was actively angry when I taught him the game. He was so upset that we spent our uh, evening on tabletop simulator get, being taught and learning Quacks of Quedlinburg. He's like, I'm never. He told me straight up, I will never play this game again. If we're playing this, don't invite me. Like. He hated wow. it. And he just he doesn't like games that are super heavy on luck right. like that. But yeah. So besides that one instance, <laughs> I've never introduced this to someone, especially the physical version, and yeah. not had them love it. And I think that that's just because usually in the instance that I've decided to bring it out, the laughing and, and those funny moments around the table have outweighed any potential like luck factors and stuff involved. So again, it's not for everybody, but for me, yeah, I'll never not have a good time playing it. And that, uh, you know, me, that, that, that skews my picks a lot because is I, I, I factor in fun factor, I guess you can say, of course, yeah. uh, almost more than anything else. And this is one of the most fun games in my collection. For sure. Honestly, when you first taught me this on Tabletop Simulator, I was like, I loved the, I had such a good time playing this the first time, yeah. second time as well. And then from that point on, I think I got up to like six or seven plays. And I'll say right now, every single time I've played this has been on Tabletop Simulator. Oh, and I know right. that part of the joy from this game is like physically reaching into the bag and pulling chips out and having the like nice components in front yeah, of you yeah. and everything. So I've never experienced the game in its full form like that. And also after you showed it to me, I think you showed it to a couple other friends. One of them really liked it. Yeah. And then there was a couple game nights later on Tabletop Simulator. One, I read the rules. I was ready to teach El Grande, which I've been wanting to play for years. This classic, really interactive uh, area control game. And someone said, oh, I don't know if I have time for a new game. Why don't we play Quacks? And I was kind of like a bit bitter. I was like, okay, <laughs> fine. Sure. And then, yeah. And then the next time, same thing. I was ready to learn. I learned all the rules for La Havre by Uwe Rosenberg. And we were going to play that. And someone was like, oh, can we play Quacks? I don't know if I have time for a game that long. So I'm kind of like spiteful now that I have not to this day played El Grande or La Havre after learning the rules, being ready to teach because other people didn't have time. So we played Quacks instead. So once we play both those games, you'll be able to love Quacks again. I think so. Yeah. Games. And I still enjoy it. And that's, I think you nailed a really good point is that you have to go into the right mindset because if you think it's a game about the best player is going to win, I have to come up with this grand strategy and skill is going to determine everything then you're not going to have a good time with it but it's always fun it's yeah. always good every time i play it but yeah nice pick thanks all right number 13 on my list is a game that you had uh, some, so i think it was in the 30s somewhere on your list and that is blue lagoon mm -hmm. yeah so this is a really fun tile laying game uh from reiner knizia and I'll say right now, I don't like it as much at two players. I've played it a couple times with two, um, and I found that I it's not a game I even want to revisit ever with two. It's so, so much better with even adding just a third player. I don't know yet if I like it more with three or four, but you're basically competing for spaces on these uh, islands. There's eight islands that you're fighting over, and literally all you do on your turn is you place a token on the board. You literally can just place one token on your turn, and you're going around the board until all of everyone's tokens have been placed, or you've collected all the resources, and you're basically, there's different goals, right? You're trying to pick up resources, you're trying to connect uh, routes across islands, you're trying to get majorities on islands. There's all these different um, mechanisms that we see in board games that all come into this game that has literally three or four pages of rules. Uh, we were just talking about fjords and, and for sale having that two-phase thing. I love the two phases of, you know, planning your first phase and setting up those huts so that you can sprout out from those huts in the second phase. Uh, it's such a fun game. I always have a great time with it. It's one that could either go up or down the list in the future just based on, I think it, I don't know if it's something I could just play like all the time. There isn't a, 
the, the only variability in the actual setup is where the resources are split out. But I think even just playing with different people and the fact that you there are different paths to victory make it feel fresh enough every time. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I, I love this game. Yeah, I won't say a whole lot more because I already talked about it, but I will add to what you said that three three player is my favorite uh, yeah. um, player count to play with. And the, I think I've played it three times at three players. Um, and it's been an absolute ride every time because it's so much fun actually having to focus your, your your what you're doing on two different people because often one person will trap you and so your response is to trap the next person to force them to either respond to you or trap that person and that yeah. becomes this amazing meta game going on so <laughs> for sure it's tons of fun and it's, it's it's harder to know like whether you've lost or won when there's a third person there like sometimes you can yeah, tell that's true yeah it, it just becomes a little bit more competitive near the end and in and, and i've had it where someone says you know i think w one time we played it was it was almost like the consensus was, oh, I think Carlo's in the lead right now or whatever, um, based on the fact that you had connected islands or whatever it was. And then uh, it wasn't until we started getting to the nitty gritty and realizing what people had for resource in their supply. We're like, wait a second. No, no, no. It's, yeah. like, it's for sure a diversion tactic, right? Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's a great game. Uh, I, I will absolutely never turn down a game of this and will, and eventually will 100% onto my collection unless I find that Fjord, the new version of Fjord just completely, you know, replaces right, that right. need for me. But yeah, yeah great game. Cool. Uh, my number 12, yeah, 12 is Ethnos. Uh, so this is pretty high on this list. Um, I really, really enjoy this game. Literally, the only thing I don't enjoy about it is the artwork. Um, I yeah. said that in my review of it. Honestly, if they if they reprinted this game with a brand new look, brand new artwork, I would... Marvel? I would, I, <laughs> no, not Marvel. <laughs> let's, let's be reasonable here. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, they reprinted it with a new uh, a new theme, uh, or even just the same thing, but same theme, but new artwork. Um, I I would buy the new version uh, to replace this one on my shelf because it's the only thing I don't I don't really care for. And other than that, I I love I, I've come to discover I really do enjoy area control games, but I, I, not all of them, but. Uh, I would say a lot of them. And this one is sort of a lighter area control game, but the way that it's implemented where the way you, you're controlling area is, is all used with this hand management system that involves, you know, like you had mentioned before, when you play uh, a card, you have to discard everything else. That's what makes the game so enjoyable sure. is that you have so many tough decisions to make and often you're going for one thing and you realize, but how much is left in the deck because you don't know when the, the round's going to end because it's when right, that certain right, card comes out, right? So we've had it where someone says... I could try to push again and hope I get another draw because then I could potentially play this or I could play now and realize I had another turn but at that point I won't be able to do anything. Yeah. And so you have really tough decisions to make and every game you end up with a completely different cast of these characters out there which all have their own abilities and in tandem with each other the, the abilities make... Uh, are, are feel different if they're paired with like if the skeletons are in the game compared to you know if the I can't remember the trolls with all the different ver uh, the wizards yeah, yeah like yeah. whatever the, even within you know yeah like I said in tandem with each other it feels different even when you've played games with those ca uh, characters out in a previous session right sure. so it's super unique it's super fun every time I've played it um, everyone has been completely wowed by it because everyone seems to have the reaction I haven't even heard of this game or in the, and they see the look on the box and they're like they think they're getting into like you know a, a pretty mundane generic fantasy, fantasy game. yeah, yeah. Uh, it, but it's anything but so I would say that honestly I think this one of those games that I one day needs a reprinting just to reintroduce it maybe <clears throat> maybe it's through a Kickstarter campaign where they add in some new components and new creatures whatever but I, I think it needs to be introduced to people uh, reintroduced to people because I absolutely adore it and I think more people would if they got their hands on it um, sure. I know yeah I know I knew you already said a lot about it but it's just it surprised me how high up on the list it was until I thought of all the sessions I've had and how much fun I had with it. Nice. Yeah, I think it was number like 38 for me or something. Yeah. I, I definitely expected it to crack your top 20. I'm not surprised that this, yeah. it's this high. Yeah. All right, my number 12 pick is a game called Keyforge. So this is a unique, uh, world's first and as of now only um, unique deck game designed by Richard Garfield who did Magic the Gathering. Came out a couple of years ago. I know we've been a bit off and on. I kind of fell out of favor with the game for a while, but recently started playing again. Um, it's kind of in a state of hiatus right now. You can go check out, I did a video on the channel about the future of Keyforge. Uh, there's all kinds of other content to learn more about how the game is played and stuff. But uh, for anyone who doesn't know, just a quick recap is the idea is you buy a unique deck for like 10 or 12 bucks. You get a 36 card deck uh, that's generated by an algorithm. It's a one of a kind deck that no one else in the world will ever have. You cannot modify it. You can't take out a card and put a new one or whatever. Um, and then it's basically a head to head Head card game but instead of other games where the goal is to just like you know attack the other player and take away their health you're racing to gain amber which allows you to forge keys and the first player to forge three keys wins the game 
It's a game that I absolutely love. It's There's so much to explore and discover in getting a new deck. Um, we've talked before about that idea of just cracking open a new deck and looking through the cards and thinking, oh, how am I going to make this work? Sometimes you get a deck that's a dud, not because it's necessarily bad, because it's just not fun to play with. I even have decks that are really, really good, really successful decks, but they're just super, they feel easy to play and they're just not interesting to play and those ones I kind of want to get rid of. So the, the game has its drawbacks. Some, some of the sets aren't as fun, some of the cards uh, sometimes aren't as fun, or you get a certain house a lot, you keep opening decks and you keep getting the same house over and over, like, I have so many decks with Sanctum and I'm so tired of them, but like, you know, the, the game has so much to offer from those replay games, you can play the same deck over and over and over, some of the decks I've played 20, 30, 40 times and I'm still discovering new combos, new ways to play them, new ways to approach it, and you're always playing against new decks too, especially if you're playing on the uh, unofficial online platform, the Crucible, hopefully they should have an official one soon. Um, um, yeah, I know it's when we played, we were like hooked on this game when oh, it first yeah. came out. We played it every chance we had, and then the pandemic and stuff, we stopped meeting up with other people, and the game kind of fizzled out. So I'm hoping it's one that you kind of get back into a little more in the future as well, and that we start yeah. playing more regularly, because I love, love, love this game. Yeah, I, I want to. I just, I, the pandemic, I think for a lot of people, just put a wrench into it. So as soon as it comes back and i'm sure i'm sure it's going to uh i am gonna for sure maybe with maybe with the new set whenever it launches yeah. I, i'm definitely gonna get back into it and i will say right now make the bold claim that i'm pretty sure in, in my opinion keyforge is the most accessible card game out there and the reason i say that is just because you literally can just buy a 12 dollar pack have everything you need to play aside from like the tokens and everything but there was ways to keep right. track of that on on separately exactly yeah. but you have everything you need to play and if you really if that's all you you know if that's all you can afford and that's all you want to go into it um you can basically just decide i'm going to get as good as i can with this deck or i'm going to figure out how to overcome its weaknesses or i'm going to figure out how to you know uh you know pursue its strengths whatever the case may be and anytime you feel like hey i've done all that and you want to get another one you just get another pack and sometimes those packs on sale for like five bucks so yeah, it's super accessible. Really, the only barrier is just learning the rules. But even then, the, compared to other card games with mana costs and all this stuff, the fact that this one is just like you know, play as many cards from your hand as you want of a certain house is a pretty accessible starting point for people too. Yeah, so it moves very quickly. Yeah, I, I think that I hope more people are able to to find KeyForge and get into it um, once it relaunches, um, and that the community thrives from there because I think the game absolutely deserves it. Yeah, and you can just buy like buy two decks or buy three or four decks if you have like a roommate or a partner, and then you. You can keep like swapping decks to different matchups every time like you can get a lot of replayability out of just having a few decks so yeah, yeah that is keyforge awesome pick all right my number 11 is kingdom builder this is a game you mentioned earlier uh it's one of my yeah one of my favorite games of all time i absolutely adore it it almost made my top 10 to be honest um there's just some other games i like better um you mentioned a lot of stuff i wanted to say about it already but i will mention that it just it's a game that makes you feel very often like a genius in the moves you're doing. And that's because as you're placing these uh, tiles on the board, you have a bunch of restrictions, uh, or not tiles, these wooden, wooden pieces on the board. You have these restrictions placed on you depending on which areas of the board you're touching. But sometimes there are ways to overcome that based on how you're gonna use your abilities, whether you're gonna use them before or after your turn, and different ways you can manipulate the board state to all of a sudden free yourself up to do things. And even if those don't win you the game, it makes you feel really successful in your turn and it impresses people around the table it just it makes you feel yeah. really good when you pull them off and the fact that the victory conditions are different every game and sometimes are working in contrast with each other in conjunction with each other makes it so that every time i've played it's it's this moment where you say okay what are the conditions oh interesting how am i going to do that oh okay we have to do this and the board state is different because of that because all of a sudden you'll have little groupings or you'll have one long line or yeah. whatever the case may be it just there is a surprising amount of variety even with how the boards can be laid out again i mentioned that I could see this being replaced over time by Winter Kingdom for me because Winter Kingdom does a lot of these things that I love, but then also adds even more variety to it. But I will say that right as of right now, it's a game that I constantly play, I would say at least once or twice a year, and I will keep going back to because whether it's digitally, whether it's the physical version, because I just have such an amazing time with it, and I, I've seemingly never gotten tired of the way it makes me feel when I play. Yeah, so for sure. I've said playing about it, the only one thing I want to add is when you mentioned the brilliant plays is yeah. if you play it with someone relatively new to the game, there's often that moment where you do something and someone goes, oh, and you're like, oh, yes. you can please love the game as much as me. Yeah. You see that kind of light bulb go Or they go, oh, you can do that? Yeah. And I go, yeah, I guess I should have explained that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. feel bad. Yeah, I know what you, I know what you mean. But yeah, it's yeah. such a great game. Yeah, it's a great game. All right, and my number 11 pick is also one that you previously mentioned in this same video, which is Res Arcana. 
Just miss out on the top 10 is one that I could potentially see cracking the top 10 in the future. Uh, this is such a good game, and it's one that I didn't, I wasn't crazy about it the first time. I know you said you didn't like it. I feel like the first time we played, we played two players at your place, and I remember yeah. I bought it because of the designer, Tom Lehman, who has designed Race for the Galaxy, which I love. Mm -hmm. And then I remember sitting there thinking afterwards, like, do I really like this game? Will I end up keeping this? Yeah. And it took me a while to play it again. And it was like, even the second play, I was kind of indifferent. And then like, after well, there was, I hit a point where I kind of like figured something out about the yeah. game. And then it kind of clicked. And now I love this game. We've played it on Board Game Arena. I just love the aspect of, first off, the fact that you have an eight card deck only. And you mentioned the drafting. It's kind of a variant, but they say right in there after you've played a couple games, you should draft. Yeah. Once you've played it enough, you should never do it without the draft because it gives you a bit of control over what you get into your deck and it evens out the playing field because no one's just getting a random deck that works well together whereas someone doesn't. Yeah. But it's that idea of kind of like you have a bunch of random stuff and you have to figure out a way to make it work. So sometimes out of your eight card deck, you're going to play maybe five or six of those cards throughout the game and then the other two you use as your fuel for like discarding to get resources or whatever. Yeah. Other games, you're going to find this little combo that involves two of your cards or three of your cards and some of the monuments or places of power on the board and you don't even care about the rest of your deck but it's always a new puzzle to figure that out in combination with your mage so the variability of all these things together and figuring out the order to do things and how to kind of navigate through what you have what your opponents have on the board when you have to suddenly shift gears because someone played a dragon or a card that can attack you so now you have to go a slightly different route you get in each other's way a lot even though there's not um, like a whole lot of like maybe direct player interaction where you're like other than like basically the dragons and stuff like that um, but yeah I love this game I have the first expansion uh, Lux at Tenebrae which I love I can't wait to get my hands on I think it's called Perle Imperii the new one uh, I think it's a game that is just yeah it, it's a testament to Tom Lehman as a game designer that he's able to get so much depth out of a game that doesn't have that many components uh, going on for it, but yeah. I just love this game. Yeah, I agree with you. It is absolutely the best Tom Lehman game that's ever been released. Wow. And, uh... <laughs> Fighting words. Fighting words. In my opinion, it's the best Tom Lehman game that I've played. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I've said enough about it too as well. I'll just, uh, yeah, ditto to everything you said. It's, it's a phenomenal game that I loved more over time. I'd be curious if you've played it and have not enjoyed it. Let us know in the comments how many times you've played it because yeah. maybe it's one of those games that you just... You need multiple plays, and for board games, that doesn't always isn't always something that people get. Sometimes sure. you only play a game once or twice at a friend's house. So I'm curious if there's anyone else out there who has played it and not liked it, and maybe this is your your ticket back to give it another shot on yeah. BGA or whatever the case may be. So yeah, I know a lot of people have also looked at the artwork and thought it's a bit generic fantasy, and some people don't like it. Personally, I don't mind. I don't like yeah. love it, but I think it's totally fine. I don't complain. Better than it. Ethnos. Yeah, oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But yeah, that's it for our 20 to 11. So uh, let us know what you think in the comments below. I guess we might have potentially hinted at, uh, might have spoiled some things about what's maybe going to be in our top 10 each. Uh, I did mention to throw your guesses in the comments below. Try to, try to rank them even from 10 to 1. At least yeah. that will make it challenging for you. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. Keep an eye out for our top 10 to 1, which will be out in a couple of days. Uh, otherwise, that's it for us. See you next time.